Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending from where you join us. This is the Startup Genome webinar on our topic um, of today, using a cloud-based data platform to track and support startup ecosystems. This is our second session today. We already had a session in the morning at 8 a.m. London time, which already sparked quite a vibrant debate. So I'm really hoping for the same intensity of questions um, from our audience, please, please. Um, feel free to put any, any of your questions and ideas uh, forward in the chat um, so that we can pick them up. Um, let me just briefly introduce our session and the agenda of today, or introduction to the webinar. Um, our core topic using a cloud-based data platform in order to analyze where we are, where our ecosystem stands, in order to think about strategy, identify gaps in the development of an ecosystem strategy as it evolves, and really to track, that's, that's our objective here as well, how ecosystem leaders, stakeholders in ecosystems are working towards achieving, achieving their goals, ach achieving um, uh, growth for the community. Um, number three, what's the impact? What's the impact of measuring? What's the impact of our activities? How do we measure them? And last but not least, and we want to carve out quite a little bit of time today for questions and answers, given the um, hugely interesting guests we, we are um, welcoming today, I would really like to leave us quite a bit of time um, for the discussion. For our webinar series, Startup Genome webinar series in general terms, we always pick upon topics we believe are pertinent to ecosystem leaders, ecosystem de uh, development, st strategy conversations and uh, topics. Previously, last time we talked about funding policy during COVID times, and uh, that was certainly a very lively debate. And luckily things seem to have turned out a little bit better than we were expecting when we had the conversation. So good news on that front. And in our upcoming series, and for those of you who want to join us, that's on May the 11th at 8 a.m. London time and 8 a.m. San Francisco Pacific time. That's value creation, not valuation an interesting intriguing title and let's see what's in the box so please mark it on your calendars if you like um, without further ado it's my great honor to have two very distinguished guests with us today first of all Kat Bolongan, director of La French Tech. Everybody will have heard about La French Tech, but I'm really curious to, to learn more about the inner machinations. And Kat, it, it would be great in a minute or two um, when, you, when you introduce yourself and the wonderful work you've been doing in France over the last few days, a uh, few years. And obviously, Joram Wingarde, founder and CEO of Deal Room, um, one of our very close partners at Startup Genome, where we work together on many data analysis projects um, all around the world uh, on a daily basis. So thanks so much for joining us today. And um, just to allow me one or two words to introduce Genome again, Startup Genome. Um, we are an organization, a mission-driven organization that seeks to help ecosystems all around the world develop faster, develop more successful, accelerate the growth of startup ecosystems as an economic engine by sharing the knowledge that we provide through data, through data analysis, but also through a vast network that we've built over the last nearly 10 years of ecosystems truly all around the world, mature and, and very young ones. And we are sharing, we are trying to facilitate a network um, where best practices can be shared, but also and sometimes behind slightly closed doors to things that didn't really work out. So always join us for these conversations in our webinars, our members meetings, in order to learn from others. That's that's the most important bit. And it's also part of this webinar today where we want to learn from Kat and Joran um, how to use data in, in better developing um, our ecosystems. That's for the introduction. Joran, maybe the word over to you and let us briefly know what you are doing, doing at your room and where you're going at your room. Yeah. Uh, thanks, Stefan. Uh, so yeah, I'm Joram Weingarde. I'm uh, Dutch. I'm uh, the founder of Deal Room started uh, seven years ago. Um, so what, what does Deal Room actually do? Uh, we provide data transparency to tech ecosystems. Um, and uh, this, this transparency is offered and, and, and has a use for different uh, stakeholders in the ecosystem. So on the one hand, you have governments um, who want to better understand and build uh, their ecosystem. And we work with uh, La French Tech, but also um, uh, the European Commission, uh, Startup Amsterdam, Scale of Porto, um, and uh, lots of other governments. The same uh, platform is also used by venture capital firms. So uh, from Index Ventures to Atomico to Axel, Local Globe, um, 
really most of the top uh, most active and distinguished venture capital firms act, that are active in Europe are uh, users, daily users of the platform and, and customers of the platform. Um, and then at the same time, corporates and startups. And really our goal is to have everybody kind of uh, working on the same uh, on the same data. Um, so specifically, I thought it's helpful to explain what we do for governments. Um, so we have a product called the ecosystem platform. What that actually is, is an API on the one hand that maintains, uh, that, that pushes basically fresh data and, um, and, and, and maintains your data in the cloud uh, combined with a dashboard uh, that allows you to measure and grow your, your uh, ecosystem. Uh, but it does actually more than that. So it's it's a public facing dashboard. So it also helps the ecosystem get make sure that everybody's better informed uh, to, to unlock network effects. Um, so a quick word, because that always comes up about how we collect data. Uh, so we aggregate public data using machine learning and, and doing a lot of manual research. And that's um, yeah, a large part of what we do every day to make sure the data is fresh and, and high quality. Uh, at the same time, we have a lot of local partnerships, uh, including the one with, with, with CAT, for example, in France, um, where uh, we tap into kind of local data, local knowledge and local sources. Um, and then thirdly, community sourced. So, we have data that's being submitted to us by startups, angels, VCs, um, and then validated by us. And so those three combined go into uh, into the data database, which we then use to create intelligence and insights. Um, last thing about that is the the platform is uh, quite rapidly expanding. Uh, so it started in Amsterdam, where we're from, uh, but we're now already in almost every major hub in uh, in Europe. And I think that's really nice. I think what we really believe in and, and actually know that Kat also believes in that is collaboration between uh, between hubs. Like there is definitely competition as well, and that's healthy. I think competition is good. It leads to better outcomes, keeps everybody on their toes and it has actually led to a lot of great things on uh, on uh, on stock options etc um, but at the same time you want to collaborate as well and you want to facilitate startups that that want to grow across borders and make uh, in not only Europe but but also other parts of the world more connected uh, so I think we, we're also helping doing that by uh, yeah, getting the, the data quality to a higher level in, uh, on, in different parts of the world. Thank you, Joram. It's great to see the way you presented to say, well, part of data is, is transparency, it's visibility, it's about making connections and uh, even connections amongst competing ecosystems. I personally also don't like the word competing that much because in the end it is more than a, than a zero sum game, um, but it's, it's great to hear. So data as a means to create visibility, transparency, and make these critical connections. Before we go into further depth, Kat, I would absolutely love to hear a little bit more about your journey with La French Tech, a big name, uh, a name that resonates around the world. Many people may not exactly know what's what's inside, so I'm delighted to have you here. Maybe you could give us just a one or two minute introduction to La French Tech. Yeah, sure. So, hello everyone. Bonjour. My name is Kat, and uh, I run a very special team inside President Macron's administration, which is called uh, La French Tech, or sometimes known as the French Tech Mission. So, La French Tech is actually the nickname of France's entire startup movement, you know, powered by the ecosystem and bolstered by the government. So as a team, we bring together these two radically different worlds. Um, at the grassroots level, you have La French Tech, which, it, which is brought alive by 15,000 um, startups and a growing network of uh, 114 communities all over the world. So, you know, you will have met maybe French Tech Amsterdam, Stefan, maybe French Tech London, and, you know, French Tech San Francisco, and so on and so forth. And what they try to do is they strive to, to really, like, promote a culture of giving back and openness while really propelling the French Tech scene forward. And the part of the team of the French tech team that I lead is specifically the part that's inside the government. So inside the government, under the wing of Cedric O, who is our Minister of Public Affairs, we function as kind of like 
like an HQ really for everything that startup that for everything that government wants to do to for, for startups. Now we have a pretty clear objective, and I say pretty clear because the president himself laid it out. Um, it's 25 unicorns by 2025. Uh, as a transitional KPI, of course, and certainly not at the price of inclusion, not at the price of the environment, and not at the price of territorial cohesion. It's important for us that when it's not called Paris Tech, right? It's called French Tech, and it's important for us that we take everybody with us as we move forward. So the question is, what can we actually do? Um, well, you know, it's pretty pretty clear when you're the government. So the, the tactics that we have at our disposal are public policy. So maybe some of you will have heard of the French Tech Visa, which is probably the most open immigration system for tech talents in the world. Um, quite a bit of funding as well. There's 1.3 billion that is, uh, that, you know, is invested directly or indirectly uh, via BPI France every year. Um, not including, for example, the 4.3 billion in emergency French tech funding that was released immediately um, after the lockdown. And then of course we have startup programs, which I guess I'll get to talk to um, talk about a bit later, where we can actually put together very specific programs. A little, they're, they're a little bit like accelerator programs that they were being run 100% by the government. Um, we have them for growth stage companies or for startups that are from tough backgrounds. And then of course, um, you know, and this is where maybe a lot of you have seen this, uh, part of our job also includes international promotion of the tech ecosystem as a whole and of our startups. You know, back in the day, we would do things like, I don't know, like send a big delegation over to CES, um, you know, back when that was still a thing. So um, yeah, so that's it. So it brings together, uh, brings together both of that and, uh, you know, tries to keep, keep the ecosystem moving in the right direction. And wonderful to have you here and also glad to, to hear that you advocate um, so so clearly with the French government and, and the, the, the Prime Minister directly. So a really, really great way to vocalize the needs, issues and so forth of, of our, our startups, our founders in, in the French ecosystem. So again, big thank you, merci for, for being with us. Um, leading a little bit into our topic after this very brief introduction, using a cloud-based data platform, um, maybe just a few considerations from my side. You know, at Genome, we consulted many ecosystems the world over, the mature ones, but also um, emerging ecosystems in many, many places. And what I see from a data perspective is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, Lots of energy, lots of act local activity where somebody puts well meaningly, puts together an ecosystem map, everybody is excited, we put a few data points on a web page and we try to connect, we try to connect community, try to enable efficient connections. We try to give startups um, a platform where they, where they can showcase the, the opportunities they present for talent, attracting talent from abroad, where they present themselves in order to attract investors, particularly those that are, that are trying and seeking to grow and are looking for the first Series A in environments where there is no Series A necessarily organically at home. Um, but also the perspective of ecosystem leaders, agencies that are First of all, trying to see are their measures active, are their measures impactful, are they creating a positive impact for founders, for the ecosystem? Um, can they use data in order, and they, they try as, as good as they can, can they use data to anticipate gaps as the ecosystem evolves, as we get more scaling companies, different funding needs, different resourcing needs? Can they actually use data and insights to prepare for these phases a year or two ahead of, of, of these support mechanisms that our ecosystems are often um, um, somewhat dependent on. And last but not least, from a government perspective, we all know the situation every year there's a budget round. We need to argue why, why taxpayers' dollars creates much more of a positive effect when we invest into our startup founders and their investors as opposed to other parts of, of the industry. So again, having clear KPIs, but also measuring return um, on taxpayers' money is certainly a good idea in order, order to reflect what, what is happening and argue and advocate for our, our, our cause. Having said that, and I introduce it as a mixed bag because I see so much energy being invested in manual activity, um, which is always great energy in the beginning, but then you see things are trailing off. Three months, six months later, manual platforms, uh, manually maintained platforms are less well maintained, the data are less accurate, the insight is less accurate, and, and kind of over time, over the first one or two years, typically stakeholders lose a little bit of trust and steam and interest as, as things are not, not going great. And I think that's really an element where, where we need to reconsider and that's what we want to introduce today really. Um, reconsider the approach as an ecosystem to something that's more standardized, more formalized, uh, more aut automated in order to really provide data and, and enable these insights with as good a database and a sound foundation as possible. After this introduction, that's that's really what we are seeing. Joram, I think you are going to take us a little bit in, through the machinations. Um, 
and Kat, uh, please please chip in in from your perspective. Um, what you've been doing at La French Tech, you're on my hand it to you with your slides over here. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> so to, to, just to kind of start with with um, where we're coming from is that we we see entrepreneurship as profoundly changing. So maybe uh, for some, yeah, I think that's probably kind of obvious to a lot of people in the in the audience here, but. Um, I still think it's good to, to, to get back to it. So if you look at talent, um, what happened in the last couple of years is that startups have become like the most attractive employer, uh, arguably for at least for a lot of, a lot of people out there. And that wasn't the case. So, um, for example, when I came out of university, the best thing you could do was work for an investment bank. At least that's what, what I thought and what my friends, uh, thought. Um, and that's clearly not the case anymore. Like if you're really, a, if you're a really smart uh, um, uh, engineer or, or, or scientist, you want to work for a startup because that, that's where the most, it's the most fulfilling, the most exciting um, um, and, and also has a huge upside. Um, and so that is like a huge change. Like if, if, if the best if that's where the best talent is concentrated, um, you know, imagine where companies are going to be in the next five to 10 years. Um, <clears throat> second, the kind of second pillar is capital. And there um, also you see like more and more venture capital is going into ecosystems. Um, and actually most economic growth now is VC backed. At least that's definitely the case in the United States. We know that's also the case in the Netherlands and, and in uh, Berlin where we've measured it. And I bet that it's also the case to an extent in France. If you look at like job growth, uh, that is mostly coming from tech companies that are nowadays almost all of them venture backed. Um, and so technology has become kind of a safe asset, but it's a complete uh, turnaround from where we were like five, 10 years ago. In the bottom right, uh, kind of third big pillar that we see is innovation. Um, and there's also the rise of academic entrepreneurs. There's more, uh, a more kind of entrepreneurial um, uh, uh, yeah, culture starting to brew in, in the universities. Uh, spin outs and are something that's now getting a lot of attention. And most of the R&D spending is actually coming from big tech companies. And then lastly, on the support side, uh, where I include governments and accelerators. I think that tech is now gen recognized also as being the biggest job growth engine. Um, and it has also led to competition for talent and capital. So that's getting a lot of attention. Um, so uh, next uh, slide, please. Uh, so our mission at Deal Room is to, to uh, help economies to become more entrepreneurial. Uh, and to do that through data transparency and like our vision uh, is to be the central intelligence layer for uh, for those ecosystems. <clears throat> so what do we mean by um, an intelligence layer? Uh, what did we mean is to have everybody working on the same data, but also being able to connect with each other. So for governments to be able to measure economic activity data, not just startup data, but economic activity, because what startups are doing is going to spill over to the whole SME uh, side too. Um, but also a way for them to communicate with the ecosystem for, for VC firms to get uh, industry benchmarks to actually source uh, deal opportunities. Um, for corporates to be able to track innovation and see the bigger picture uh, and for startups to be able to fundraise um, uh, at least have the data to so that they have access to um, um, to the same to the same investors and that can be really yeah creating a level playing field uh, for uh, for startups Maybe, maybe Kat, if I may, um, can I bring you in here a little bit when you when you see the, the different 
the central data layer and the, the different aspects. Let me pick one or two. Um, Joram just mentioned the increasing activity of university spin outs as, as an example, young startups filling, filling up the, the, the funnel of, of our ecosystem. What kind of, kind of perspective, so where do you use your ecosystem data? most of the time, most frequently, what's most relevant from, from I mean, the I mean, tech perspective? I think it's maybe it's slightly different for me because the ecosystem is my job 100%. So um, I think, it, you know, people will look at this and be like, oh, it's macro level data to tell us a little about, about the context, about the overall background, but the thing is the context in the background is like completely like our job, right? So um, I, I was mentioning this earlier. Uh, so I was appointed uh, about three years ago and it was actually a piece of data that, um, that describes a lot of what we do today. So when I was appointed, it was around the time I started getting into, um, you know, looking up all of the analysis that was published then, and, you know, Dealroom wasn't published in like half as much then as they are now. So, you know, information was a lot more scarce. Um, you know, I had to kind of like knock on doors, ask BPI friends what they had on them, ask people who were scraping um, data off, you know, lots of different sources what they would have. And, and eventually there was a report that put together that uh, showed me one number um, showed me lots of different numbers, really, but really there was like one number that stuck. And uh, it was the one number that I thought really um, explained what the challenge of the French tech ecosystem was, was then there. It was the, so the number is 1%, and uh, 1% was the graduation rate of our Series C startups um, in 2017. And I saw that and I was like, what, <laughs> wait a minute, what's going on? Like, how can we say we have this great ecosystem and we're trumpeting like all of this change and all of this momentum. And then all of a sudden you get to like, you know, series C and there it is, the number telling me it's the valley of death. So a lot of what we do today, if you look at all of the biggest, uh, the biggest programs that we've rolled out or the biggest initiatives that we've rolled out, um, all of them are, are, are linked to the fact that we were very, very conscious as soon as we started the second French tech mission in 2018, that growth stage was going to be a problem, that we could support early stage as much as we wanted. We could keep on pushing, um, you know, all of the incubator, you know, we, fought, we continue to like push all of the incubators and the accelerators and try to create this really great environment and support all of our communities all across France and things like that. But if they kept on hitting the wall, every time they would hit, hit, hit Series C at some point, um, lots of bad things would happen. One, uh, you know, the ROI that we promised our stakeholders, our stakeholders being the French people, just would never pan out. Um, two, everybody would say that this was all a big bubble. And three, people would peace out and just kind of like leave for the US where, you know, their graduation rates were much better. So, you know, for, for a solid year, we had like 100% focus, you know, we focused completely on that, on, on that number. Um, so, you know, if, if you look at some of the flagship um, things that, you know, the French government rolled out, um, you know, can't take credit for everything. Uh, you know, one thing that I am happy about though was talent. So, so um, you, so you know, what we do is basically what I did was that I interviewed quite a lot of Series B and Series C uh, startups. You know, back then, which really just three years ago. It's not like the list was 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 that long. Um, and everybody said that where they were stuck uh, was talent, right? Like that's where uh, that's where they were completely stuck. And then you know we started looking at the numbers regarding like foreign hires and realized, or one of the numbers that I uh, that I got through a survey that you know we launched for French tech. Um, French tech startups, uh, Series B and above, was like what language they speak at the office. And I realized that way too many were still be speaking French. And I was like, okay, that's an awful sign. And then we realized immigration was a real issue and they were having um, trouble bringing in like, you know, the best talent from all over the world into the country. And so we rolled out, uh, you know, uh, the French tech visa, which is like the most open uh, tech visa today. Um, if you look at funding, for example, um, for France, right? Like if you look at the one funding project that the president himself like negotiated and arm wrestled, um, you know, a, a lot of investors, uh, it was to have the 6 billion um, in funding that was negotiated um, from, from private investors actually, from, uh, from insurance companies. And that was injected directly into uh, the growth stage ecosystem. So it was half of it went to, um, half of it went to uh, uh, growth stage VCs that really needed to you know, put, move up their, you know, their minimum tickets up to 50K, sorry, 50, 50 million. Um, and then the other one went, uh, went to injecting liquidity into the ecosystem. So that's like one case. And then the case today is like, so you know, now the question is like, well, what are those decisions that people like me and, and you know, maybe the same thing is happening in your respective governments? What are the decisions that we're making every day and what data do we have or not have um, um, to make them? Um, one important decision that we have to make at a pretty, 
um, pretty often is what's important, like what counts and what doesn't count. Um, we know when you have a, a government which is as close to the ecosystem as ours, uh, that, that means you have a lot of incoming, right? Like every day we'll get like, you know, literally like dozens of emails. And I'm talking about myself, I'm talking about Cedric, oh, who's the minister, the president probably gets a whole bunch himself as well. All of his, all of his advisors get a whole bunch of stuff as well. And, you know, these are all people who know someone, who knows someone, who knows someone, who has source of VC, who you met at those things, who's an investor. So you have all of this incoming. And the first thing that you have to, you have to decide all the time is what, what's important, what counts, what are the, if I have only like X, X months and X, um, X amount of, um, of like uh, energy, what do I have to focus on? So we use a lot of the data and we log it in um, through our systems to be able to do proper pattern recognition. And the pattern recognition is showing us, um, it is showing us for example, a lot of sector-based trends. So this is something we never did before. Like before the crisis, we never, like my team, we never treated the startups. Uh, we, we, we treated them um, by stage. Right. So we would have like a different team handling like, you know, you know, really early stage and emergence, things like that, different teams handling growth stage. And then all of a sudden, when all of the data from the crisis came in, you know, we realized that we were dealing with full on sectors. We didn't even care that they were startups anymore. They were just like high priority companies that were growing quickly or not because it was the crisis in very specific verticals. So, for example, what, you know, some some data that was really interesting was, um, um, well, you know, which a lot of companies, a lot of different uh, countries did is you want to figure out during the crisis which are um, which are the companies or which are the sectors that were getting hit and it seems really obvious to us right now right but the thing is you're not doing post analysis months later right you want to know the day before it hurts everyone when it's actually happening so so it's not just about having the data and analyzing it, it's having it right away and analyzing it like one second after um, so that's when we were able to pinpoint really early like which what, not just which tourism startups, but which type of tourism startups um, were being affected and how, how the B2B SaaS startups were being affected and how um, our data wasn't even strong enough because we were too slow. Like uh, we, it's, the data that we get comes from, um, you know, people making a lot of their uh, requests for, um, you know, for government back loans and things like that. So it was too late by the time it would get to us. So to enrich like a lot of the data that we had, we had to like go to actual VCs and ask them, you know, to confirm, for example, some of our biases on, on what was going on and, and yeah. you know, because we had to be really quick. So that's another one. And then there's another one that has to do with services. So I know it's, it's, it's something that's a little bit more specialized. So we have this program in France called um, the French Tech Next 4120. And the French Tech Next 4120 are like 120 are literally like the 120, you know, like startups with the best performance uh, in France. Um, it's a mix of different criteria, all of which is quantitative. There's no jury for it. So we're looking at, you know, total amount of funding raised over the last three years. We're looking at year on year growth. We're looking at like their, you know, um, actual revenue and things like that. And a lot of our policy is based on those 120 companies, um, not because we really care about growth stage more than everybody else. Uh, but one, also because we have a lot more data on them than we have I mean, we've seen. We have like all of their cap tables, all of their tax declarations, everything um, at, at a pretty like uh, at a pretty regular rate. So we're able to analyze more things. Now, we're working with a we're working with a French Tech 120. And prior to the French Tech 120, before this program existed. So anyway, sorry, the way that the program works is that uh, it works like a marketplace, essentially. These 120 companies have access to uh, a whole swath of different perks that have been put together by various French tech correspondents across the government. They're over 50. Um, to give you a few really concrete examples, if you say are handling a really complex uh, import export operation smack dab in the middle of Brexit. Well, we have a French tech correspondent at Customs, so we'll work with you and your team to make sure nothing slips. Um, if you are suddenly expanding across uh, Europe and you're not quite sure how like, how like VAT works um, and how the coordination functions and you're scared you're gonna make a mistake, we have people from the tax authorities in France that will walk you through that. Um, if you're scared you're going to get like, uh, I don't know, you're going to get like audited by, I don't know, Ministry of Labor or something like that. Um, because you, you, know, you suddenly made, put in place these new changes and it's unclear how that functions, we can have the ministry, we can have those people actually pre-audit you um, without, without anything having any, any actual legal um, implication and what is you're doing so that you know um, what's going on. We could put you in the plane of the president if you wanted to do biz dev in China and he was going to China, we could take you to Davos with him. Anyway, so that's how this whole thing works. Um, and, and the thing that has helped us a lot um, is is this program? So pr prior prior to this program and and you know all of the data 
um, that we were getting from the startups, I, I can tell you a bunch of things we didn't know. One, I did not know that so much of our tech ecosystem was industrial. I had no idea. Like in my mind, like everybody else, we're thinking like B2B SaaS are probably the most, probably the FinTech, probably those guys. And then you look at the actual numbers and you realize like 26% of 120 of France's like top growing startups all have an industrial component. You know what that means? That means that that means that we need to step up when it comes to helping them on those particular areas. That means they're not looking for funding in the same places that the that the more digital startups are looking. It, it, it means that you know they're also the means are also spread out across um, across uh, the territory. Like we think that just because they're ba they're in, in Paris, it means they're physically in Paris, but they're not. They're actually all across because that's where their factories are. Um, so that changed uh, a lot and we had to partner with BPI France, we had to build out a whole bunch of new different programs um, in, in like sort of like internal programs with the Ministry of Economy just to be able to do that. Um, one other thing that we didn't know um, about this ecosystem is, um, is, is how much of them came from research. Um, you know, we tend to, in the, in the past, we tend to sort of split like deep tech and then French tech. It used to kind of be like that, where you have like all the science, all the sort of science kids on one side, and then all of the, again, like the sort of marketplaces and SaaS solutions on the other side. And we realized that uh, a lot of them um, really like uh, had deep tech components. And again, we weren't, we weren't good uh, when it came to supporting them um, and accessing like and things like, you know, whatever, like um, protecting their intellectual property as they expanded internationally or being able to bring in researchers uh, from abroad or tech transfer and things like that. So we had to step up our game on that as well. Um, and then of course there are other numbers that like we're talking about performance, but then what some of the numbers that we started um, measuring mostly through some of our partners is also diversity data and more specifically like uh, the, you know, where the women are. Um, you know, like, which is something that is like painfully important uh, to us as well. And, you know, as, as we like to say, you, if something counts, you need to count it. Um, so that's something also that we've, we've been, we've been much more sensitive to. And I think, had we not known, I mean, you know how dire it is, right? It's not, a, you don't need the data to tell you how much things suck. We all know it sucks. Uh, the question is where exactly is it sucking? Right? Is it is it happening um, for specific roles? Is it happening, um, you know, at, at the time that people are applying? Is it how you know? Is the pipe what, what is the pipeline of the VCs actually look like? What looks like before? What does it look like before and after? And then then through that we're able to try like a bunch of different uh, a bunch of different initiatives. We've tried everything from quotas to like paid advertising targeting women um, to to make sure that we even it all out. So anyway, I mean those are those are just. Um, those are just some some use amazing, cases. Yeah. Amazing, amazing summary already. I've taken so so many away, and and I think <laughs> it's 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 lots lots of them. We we are at Genome also also looking at so the one percent, for instance. We look at so many ecosystems, and politicians that are really proud of their achievement. We've created five hundred. We've created a thousand, fifteen hundred young startups, and then we go into these pyramids and have to say, well, you only got. 0.8 percent you've got yeah. 0.95 percent that are actually graduating to to a scale-up segment so what's what's the next phase is that right my, my yeah. question for you actually Stefan and Yoram is so it's like I'm like Please. telling you this is how we roll but like do you like you guys work with tons of different governments right mm -hmm. and I'm wondering does your average government you know out of most of the people that you work with do they actually know how many jobs their startups are creating on average like, do they know what the net job creation? I mean, no, these are we're talking about the numbers that matter the most, right? The numbers that matter the most when you're investing in your ecosystem is like you can talk about like total amount of funding raised and graduation rates and all that sort of stuff. But the truth is like no one cares about that except for people in the ecosystem. If you were investing yeah, as yeah. much as we are investing, you only really care about a few things. You care about net job creation, um, and, and you most, care about yeah, and, and you most, care about uh, sovereignty. Do. Yes, are you saying? And most, 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 most do, but I don't think they have any means of national statistics are really not geared. You get this, this, this mm. melange out of SMEs, traditional SMEs and startups. So there's no, no real number. We often do model uh, job creation directly through startups mm -hmm. and scale-ups. Again, to your point, scale-ups are the, the engine of real uh, job creation. It's not, not smaller startups, but also the, the kind of wider economic effects. So one, how many jobs does, does a job in a startup create in the wider economy in terms of services industry, et cetera. It's a nice, it's a nice point, actually. I think, Joram, it takes us into, into our, our the, 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 the second part of this conversation, what's actually impact. Mm. What can we measure? What do we see in data? And from my perspective, and I think for many in the audience, what do we read out of data that can influence our strategy? In your shoes, Kat, 
um, in, in our shoes as, as, as policy advisors and, and obviously the ecosystem leaders who are participating. Um, so maybe I, I move us a little bit on, Joram, if you want to talk for a minute or two about what you see in terms of impact measurement. What's the impact that we can create, that we can see through data? And maybe Kat and I can comment a little bit from, from a, pers a strategy perspective where we are actually using these insights and, uh, and, and driving to the right conclusions. Yeah. Johan, do, we, do you want to take it forward for a minute or two and then we, we chip in again? Yeah, yeah, I will keep it short. Um, so, so yeah, here on the right, you see the number of startups that we are, have been tracking in, in France. Uh, so 10K, 12K was kind of before we started working with La French Tech. Um, then we launched uh, together with La French Tech an, an open access database. So it is like a nationwide database, no paywall, it's free for everybody. Um, and so we, we doubled down kind of our efforts to, to, to use AI, but also now we're using the trade register. And thanks to promoting the database, we got user submitted data back. So now we have uh, 25,000 startups that we're tracking. Um, and then on the next uh, slide, it also shows the, that the, uh, the, uh, the number, that the amount of data per startup has exploded basically. <clears throat> so we now have data on, on the hiring, the number of, the actual number of employees at a company, but also how many uh, job openings they have and, and, and which job openings, tech stack, a lot of data about the founder team. Um, so like, is it, is it a diverse team or not? Do they have previous founder background, uh, you, even an age estimate, uh, you name it. So you can do a lot of interesting things with that. And also a lot of data about the, what the company does and, and what their playing field, competitive playing field uh, looks like. Right, so we are getting uh, much more granular. I'm just picking up on what what Kat said. Where are they actually coming from? Deep, the, the big evolution in deep tech, the big trend in deep tech. The big impact, I personally believe, and I've seen it in London so many times, and it will be the same in, in Paris, I would assume, and in many other places, how diverse a team is. And I don't necessarily only mean gender. I also mean international passports and cultures that are coming together. Um, it's got such a great impact on investability and growth objective mm. or growth capability of a, of a startup. So being to a, being able to see it on an individual basis, but also from an ecosystem perspective in an aggregate to ask the question, mm. why are these companies in a certain place scaling better? Probably because they are more diverse. I mm. mean, the usual answer is always they are better invested. Yeah, that might be, but but uh, there are probably other success factors that are, that are playing a role into it. And it's interesting to see how your, the depth of data has evolved uh, with the platform here that allows us to ask these questions individually, but also in aggregate. Yeah, and I guess I look at trends as well, right? Like, um, I mean, so I can tell you if for Francis top 120 startups, like, you know, 42% are women in their companies. Everyone's mm -hmm. like, oh, that's great, 42%, that's amazing, like, hooray. Um, except that there are a couple of other things that, you know, when you really dig into it, you're like, okay, it's, it's a good start, but really there's, we can go a bit further because you look at, if you look at their executive committees or their boards, only 28% um, are, you know, are women. And then something that you also notice, and I mean, Yoram, I guess you're seeing this, like, as you, startups are actually more diverse as their late stage for the simple reason is that all their support functions happen once they start scaling, right? So like all of their like customer care, marketing, comm, HR, all of the things that are like traditionally or culturally more associated um, towards women pop up later. And so those numbers actually, you know, um, start cleaning up like where it's like a total disaster, for example, is like, you know, deep tech outside of health tech. Um, deep tech outside of health tech, it's like almost like exclusively like, you know, very, very masculine environments and, and, you know, where it's an issue, it's you both have sciences and you also have the fact that they're very early stage, so zero support function. So I think we try to be careful also with data because sometimes data, sometimes data will give you the, the story that you think you want to tell politically and you think you can get away with. But if you're not digging and really trying to see what it means or what it represents or how it fits in like the, the overall picture, it can tell you the wrong story and can also be very easily manipulated in that way. And that's more, we want, we want to get to the real insight and the real, the real KPIs to hold ourselves accountable yeah. against. Um, yeah, and Johan, um, I think you 
get a get a number more um, a number of, of of insights as to investment etc shall we shall we briefly have a look yeah um very quickly so the we were now we are now tracking over fifty thousand jobs at at startups in france and we were able to partner with welcome to the jungle which is like a leading job board in france really well known and great company uh, but also aggregating jobs from the websites directly uh, and uh so now you can do what I think is super cool searches, such as I want to work at a, a social impact startup at series A stage. Um, but you can also search for um, uh, a, a developer job at a payment uh, company, for example, that's at series B stage. So you can do stuff that, that just wasn't possible before now. Uh, so I think that's cool. Um, and uh, now, yeah, there's a lot of curated data as well. So it's not just raw data. I think maybe it's a little bit to Kat's point. It's not data is can get also in the way of, of, of what's really happening. So we, we also try to, uh, to spend a lot of time on, on curating that and making it possible for anyone to, to navigate different uh, industries. Um, it, this is just one slide that I think is cool. We don't need to read every single number here, but it just shows you what you can do. Um, like kind of the red line shows the trajectory, growth trajectory of a startup that's not VC backed. And then the other blue lines show with 1 million of funding or with even more funding, how, how, what's the impact. Um, and, and so that, and this is the impact on job growth. Um, uh, but also growth of the company. So it, it shows, by the way, also that before a company really gets to scale can take easily 10 years. Um, so you need to be be patient. Not every startup blitz scales to, to hundreds of people in within three years. Uh, 10 years is actually pretty normal. Um, so this is um, um, just showing what you can do with data. That's great. And I think that's that's maybe the last one, but I, I really liked it. You, you showed us the different funding sources and how they change by, by a life cycle stage. Maybe a few last words, Jero. Yeah, um, so I think, so this shows where uh, funding is coming from. And at seed stage, most of the money is coming from domestic funds. So that's 36% and 26 from the rest of Europe. And by the way, this, this is showing startups based in London. Uh, but we've done the same analysis for others, other startups. And so it shows the drop-off, which is kind of normal and it's what you expect, uh, but the drop-off is quite steep. So in, in London, it happens at 100 million plus rounds where you really see there's not enough, uh, there's not, a, not enough local capital. Like it's great to, to, to have US and Asian investors on board if that's the decision that the startup, if that's what the startup wants, it's fantastic. But if they are forced to do that uh, because there are no other options, then then that's not what you want. And I think that's um, that's also uh, it relates with with Kat's point about the the kind of conversion from B to C. And by the way, at the bottom you see the these ranges, kind of what is a seed, what is a Series A. Uh, we've spent a lot of time with venture capital firms on kind of creating a standard because uh, nowadays it's all over the place. You see like 100 million seed rounds, uh, money is being raised through uh, SPACs. Uh, so yeah, you, we, we need to get to some standardization instead of only self-reported labels. I actually like that. You know, we are, we are big into peer comparison. Yeah. It's always nice when you look at data from your own from your own shop, your own environment. But what really defines good, and it's it's, it's always the, the most valuable to actually compare against somebody who is comparable, similarly sized city. Mm. What's happening there, and what really defines best in class, and, and to yeah. be to be able to compare. Yeah. And actually, like when really sorry, just looking at your question, Yoram, and I, I see we're going through really complex data. But I think like the the thing that that you know, if we're talking about policymakers, the thing that is super hard for a lot of policymakers um, when they do startup driven startup related policy is that they don't even have uh, an exhaustive list of who their startups are, right? Um, and because they don't have any, you, you know, you said the, the S word earlier, which is standard. And because there isn't like a specific standard on that. Now we had to put one in in France 
Um, we had to put one in in France uh, for the simple reason that, you know, it affects the visa. Like if it's a startup visa, then only startups can use it. It affects, um, it affects funding as well. Like when we did the government backloads, the, the clauses for startups and the conditions under which startups could use it was completely different. Um, so we had to do that. But, you know, I, I don't know if I ever told you this, Yaron, but like true story, we, I, we almost put into the executive decree that a startup is defined as a company being on deal room, <laughs> less than on deal room. Oh, and I like that. Listed on deal room, we're like, then it's obviously a startup. So this way we don't have to, you know, because we had to be able to do it really quickly. And in the past, you know, to be able to decide what a startup is not in the past, like I mean, like three, up to three years ago, we would actually have like government bureaucrats analyzing these dossiers like individually to analyze whether or not they thought that the project was innovative enough. Um, and now because we have to go super fast, um, you know, we need to have very black or white criteria and it's not a matter of like, you know, it's a matter of being able to access something really quickly. So, you know, as a tip for any of the policymakers, um, you know, watching this webinar, know that it's, to we've looked at it, it was totally possible, we could have done it, but it was that we were getting so much traction already based on the very simple questionnaire that we had because of the visa, we, we opted not to, but it was actually legally totally possible to say a startup is defined as uh, a company being on DealRoom's platform. It's nice to hear. We had in the morning, uh, Joram will recall that in our discussion with Porto. <laughs> Similar question, what actually defines a startup? And, and, and from, from my perspective, more strategic perspective, in a sense, we see with many governments, national statistical offices trying to do a great job, but in the end, they, they amalgamate a lot of different segments. And then you get this kind of this mix of SMEs and, and startups. Um, some tracking data, some, some insights out of analysis, and they're all wrong because they are not wrong, but they are so unspecific that you cannot really see development. You can't really devise policy. You can't really, really have a, an honest and database conversation in the end to say, did my measure, my startup program, did it actually move the needle? Yes or no, because it's, it's, up, it's obscured by too many different data points. I must say, I've never seen in the world an ecosystem where, uh, sorry, uh, a national statistical office, government driven, that actually would allow us to report in a way that we as ecosystem leaders um, need mm. the information. You have no choice. I mean, when you're like, it's very different if you're doing it for whatever census reasons. And it's another mm. thing you're, if you're doing it for very policy reasons and you're also, you know, like us, you're, you're actually investing quite a lot in the ecosystem. I think the thing that was really tricky for us, um, and again, you know, for all the policymakers that are watching is that whatever definition you have, it has to be binary. It has to be yes or no, because you can't allow any kind of like, you know, human analysis into uh, any of the applications. So, so for us, just like, you know, maybe for, for people that are listening in, um, for us, it's like, are you, they just have to start, start up as a startup that checks one of the following criteria. It's like, are you venture back? Yes or no. And then we have like a full list of, uh, you know, a full list of, uh, of VCs that were you ever in an incubator accelerator um, at any point uh, in your, in your career? Yes or no. Um, do you, were you able to access any of the sort of government innovation funds, like, you know, the tax R and D tax credits and things like that for younger startups? And it's like, yes or no. And then, um, and then beyond that, it's, then it's all beyond that it's all manual. Um, and some of the cases we'll look into manually. Sometimes if you have a letter of recommendation, it'll come in and things like that. So the truth is that the only thing that we're really missing are, um, startups that don't raise at all. Um, and, and unfortunately, the, most of those, most of those um, startups that don't raise at all tend to be by like, tend to be self-funded also because they're, you know, second time, uh, second time entrepreneurs and things like that. But it's still a pretty small percentage. You know, maybe from your perspective, uh, we, we hear it a lot that deals don't get shown, data is incomplete. What can we do, particularly for, for those amongst us who are not coming from the, the top ecosystems, and maybe not, not so much the, the Anglo-Saxon world, if I may say it this way, where we are a little bit more used to disclosing a lot of data. So working in Eastern Europe is an example, some Asian ecosystems where people are maybe less, less willing to disclose data. Investors, private investors are, are much less willing to disclose data, et cetera. What can we do as these ecosystem leaders to make sure we feed the right information to you and, and other platforms? Yeah, I think we, you have, we, what we try to do is, is show startups uh, the value of, of actually contributing um, and giving them a lot back. And that's why we made the platform free. Uh, you can use it for recruiting. It's re actually used by all the top VCs. So the chance they find you is much higher. But yeah, to Kat's point, if you're not 
if you if you're not looking for VC funding, you're always recruiting. So we hope that that gives uh, an incentive. Um, and this uh, kind of curated data that I showed earlier is uh, that's great research for founders that they can also use to to, to understand their kind of competitive landscape. Uh, and we noticed that, yeah, we can uh, uh, if we if we if we if the quality of our data is good, uh, then they want to be on there themselves as well. Um, and uh, yeah, and if not, we still have the trade register data that we can uh, that we can try to, to 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 get as much data from as possible. Okay, but first point would be, as ecosystem leaders, let's let's drum up a little bit of enthusiasm and drive in order to make sure, yeah, that that information gets disclosed. Exactly, and I, actually, I, I I my sense is that it's really changing across Europe, in Germany, and and also Central and Eastern Europe. People become much more vocal, and uh, they understand that it's all about uh, being seen. Um, whereas in the U.S. There is maybe more trend now towards kind of stealth, more stealth. Um, being stealth is, is, is kind of back in fashion a little bit in the US, is, is my sense. Okay. I don't have data to back that up. <laughs> yeah, I heard it. it's an interesting one. I would have thought it's the other way around, but that's, that's quite telling. Kat, in a, in a sense, um, when, when we do ecosystem strategy, even when, when we have governments, there's this whole point about you need to create visibility, not only visibility within your community, that's obvious, but but also um, globally in order to attract resources, resources, talent, resources, investment, resources, knowledge from, from business models from abroad that can be brought in. When you think about a marketing communications, visibility mm. is maybe the better words, visibility is really the best word for its um, initiative for La French Tech. How important is data versus the more classical work in, in PR, in campaigns, et cetera? There, there's a bit of both. I mean, you know, I'll be really honest with you. So like each, each country always has that like one or two pieces of data that they love to trumpet around every mm. year, right? And we are like 100% guilty of that. We are 100% guilty of being like, this year we beat our records and raised a total of 5.4 billion as an ecosystem, you know, like, and, 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 and it's really interesting to say, and, you know, my experience has been that those numbers are almost more important to your own ecosystem who, you know, who are also betting on themselves really and betting on the ecosystem that they're in and they need to know things are moving forward. Every time you pitch that data to like, you know, I could do it right now when pitching the, the growth of the French tech ecosystem. No one will understand what I mean because most of the time, most people don't know how much funding their respective ecosystems have raised anyway. They have no sense of, they have no real sense of benchmark. Um, but I think like where it's important is so, so, so where that number is important is if I put it in the context of the fact that, well, actually, according to that data in a report that was published by Atomico, it shows that France was you know, the only uh, country out of like the, you know, the big three uh, European tech ecosystems to have grown uh, during the crisis, like up by uh, almost uh, 20%, as opposed to, you know, like, uh, you know, the UK and, uh, and Germany, um, then it starts to get really interesting. But even still then the story that you're telling is like, okay, something interesting happened during the crisis it doesn't mean French tech is killing it. It means something interesting happened during the crisis that France did and nobody else did, and no one else did. What was it? And then you get into, you know, we, these are like fun conversations that we've been having um, at the sort of European level. Then you get into, okay, then let's see what is the difference between the French policy and how it helps an ecosystem um, sort of weather uh, the crisis versus like other ecosystems that were doing very, you know, very well um, pre-crisis. And, and it's really interesting because, you know, like I've had to sort of like defend almost like a religion really, the French model. Like the French model is super weird, right? Like it's, um, you know, Sifted has this really cute nickname for it. They call it like the very, very visible hand uh, in the sense that the French tech ecosystem, perhaps unlike many other ecosystems in the world and certainly many European uh, ecosystems um, has had a lot of government intervention and engineering. Whether that is, you know, the tremendous amount of money that has been directly like invested directly either like through fund of funds or through subsidies or, or through direct investing um, uh, or the creation, for example, of a team like mine, which you know, doesn't have a real um, like direct equivalent in almost any other European country. Um, you know, uh, these, are, these are things that um, at the end of the day kind of like 
are hard to defend when nothing's happening, you know? Um, so, I mean, you know, that, that's one of the things that, that I think that, that came out, I think in the, like, you know, deal room took a lot, lot um, you know, was very involved in that. A lot of the kind of like post-crisis analyses and what are the policies that help? Because I think we're talking a little bit about making decisions. So like, if we're, if we're talking about like all of the use cases of cloud-based um, um, data, there's obviously like, you know, making decisions, as we said earlier, convincing people that startups are important and startups are moving forward. Um, but I think another one is also just like accountability and just trying to see like if the stuff that you put in place is actually working or not. Um, and, and I think that's the challenge for, for, for teams like mine. It is, you know, so, you know, when I will have finished my term, it's very, I think it will be very difficult for me to assess what part of this tremendous success of the French tech ecosystem um, has known over the past few years is thanks to my team, thanks to my government, you know, thanks to my president, and what part of it just sort of like happened on its own. And the only way you can do that is if you really kind of like do a lot of comparative analysis, which, you know, yeah. fortunately, thanks to, to Deal Rome and the start of Gino, we'll, we'll, we'll be able to do. We will certainly keep the pulse on, on what you're doing, Kat, that, uh, <laughs> with, with peer benchmarking. That's why it is so important, undoubt, undoubtedly, undoubtedly. Looking a little bit at our, our, our clock, we are nearly approaching the end of our seminar. It's fantastic and super insightful discussion. Maybe you are two, three takeaways for any ecosystem leader, any ecosystem initiative that's contemplating working stronger with a data platform, an organized way to, to organize data, draw analysis. What are your two, three key takeaways? And I know you got some really strong points here. Um, we heard them, we heard them already. Um, okay. But I'll leave it to you. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, yeah, I think I just had one, uh, one point, um, but maybe I can think of a second one while I explain this, the first one. So. The, the, the main point is to start early and it takes time to, to build up a good uh, data platform. And I think some of the stuff that I showed earlier, uh, and there was uh, some, some more analysis there that we, that we skipped, but it's still interesting. It, it's from the Netherlands and Amsterdam where we've been working together for five years. Um, so to, to, to really cover your ecosystem in a lot of detail, is, it's a complex task. And uh, of course, you can do a lot in the first three months and launch um, and, and, and start to promote it. But um, to, to, to get to the right level of detail, you, you know, think two, three years ahead. And so start early and start sooner the better. And that actually brings me to the second key takeaway is I think for a successful uh, data platform strategy that's public facing, you need to think about and spend time on marketing it to your ecosystem. Like, like think about getting people to pay attention actually to it and to contribute. So invest a bit in, in, uh, in, in kind of your brand and your presence to get people excited about the project so they, have, so they get buy-in. Because getting the kind of contribution from startups themselves uh, that can bring data to really to a whole nother level uh, of, 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 uh, of detail. Thank you, Joram, and I'm, I'm with you here. As you know, at Genome, we do, we do very in-depth founder surveys and ecosystems at scale. It's incredible the, the amount of data you get out of it, but it obviously works with community. If startups and founders are not convinced you're playing a value back to them, to their community. It's not going to work and they're not going to invest their time. So that's 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 always the, the community play to say, help me get to a level of analysis that's actually helpful for you as a community and as, as fellow members of that community. Kat, maybe one or two take key takeaways for policymakers, the audience today to consider from your experience. For policymakers? Okay, number one, definitely don't do it yourself. It's really hard. <laughs> I know, like, oh, I, I, mean, I, can see, I can see you're <laughs> laughing, but I mean, I'm sure you've like encountered, I don't know how many governments is like, we don't need to use this. We can do this ourselves. And, you know, all of these, every single one of them, like they, you know, they all kind of, you know, systematically um, fail to a certain extent. You know, one, one approach that we're, we've been taking recently, you know, where we still, there's still quite a lot of progress to be done. But I think where governments, if you want to invest in anything, invest in your own API. Um, because these are APIs that you can easily sort of like, you know, cross with, uh, you know, deal rooms APIs or other APIs, because you have, a, like, we have a lot of data that will never be public, right? We have a lot of data, like, you know, like I said, we have like everyone's cap tables. We, we, we know like the, um, we have, um, you know, tax declarations, we have, um, 
uh, what else do we have? Like everything, you know, like the, their entire dossiers, every time they fill out um, applications for R&D uh, tax credits, um, you know, every single kind of like government uh, control that they've had over the past few years and things like that. And I think it's, it's, it's been, you know, most, most, most countries, actually very few of them have a consolidated view of all of that. And we don't yet 100%, but we're getting there. But a lot of that comes from like an internal, um, an internal API that the French government has been, has been working on. So the truth is like, if you don't have something like that, that's solid. Every time you're looking at other databases, you don't actually, you, you're gonna have a really hard time um, kind of like, you're gonna have a hard time um, using your own data afterwards and conciliating it with the other, you know, other, other sources to get a sort of bird's eye view of everything that's going on. So um, definitely that. And I think like, yeah, this is definitely for governments. I think this is in general, general, but even specifically for this topic, it's like things like this always look really easy. You know, when you're a government, you're like, oh yeah, we could totally do that. We can build our own deal room internally, or we can, uh, we can do our own report. There are two reasons why I would encourage everybody to partner with um, organizations like Startup Genome and for Deal Room. One is that, you know, it's just that, you know, there's like just a lot of more, there's a lot more experience. It's a lot richer. Um, there are a lot of things that, you know, um, you know, a lot of things that we don't necessarily have at that level of, uh, of, of granularity, um, even though there's a lot of, of like improve it and things like that. The second one is just, it's just not credible. The truth is like, we could have published our own data. No one would believe us, it'd be propaganda, you know? I mean, I mean so that, that's kind of like a, an, an approach that kind of like, instead of just, uh, instead of like always just doing like I don't know if you've noticed this you know both Stefan and, and Yoram like we don't do we don't publish our own data anymore we don't publish our own annual reports anymore we don't we don't do any of that we would rather partner with like you guys or with Sifted or whatever because at the end or we you know or help Atomic go find the data that they need when they're doing reports because at the end of the day I think it's much more valuable when the ecosystem is speaking um, speaking for you that's a lovely summary Kat thank you so much merci um to, to both of you, Kat, Yoram, thank you so much for, for spending so much time with us today. I would encourage the audience, um, please contact either Kat and, and Yoram if you have any questions in regards to the use of data, a data-driven ecosystem strategy. And Kat is, is, is laughing here, maybe maybe not too many your way because you got your hands full with La French Tech and the great things you are contemplating going <laughs> forward. But Yoram and and and, and uh, dear Roman and, and we here certainly in Startup Genome are most happy to happy to guide such a conversation. That absolutely makes sense. Um, I love what we heard about start very early about a data-driven strategy because it is more objective. From my own experience, it is so much better to have a a data-based analysis-based discussion when it is about budget, when it is about decisions, when it is about policy impact to have that with a politician or a source of funding and um, to really argue based on, on sound data as opposed to gut feeling and opinions um, that, that there are many in the room. Um, that's certainly, certainly incredibly powerful. Get to a level of standardization, get to a level of a data model that's actually sustainable. So not always these, these initiatives home cooked and after three months or six months or at, late, uh, at the latest uh, 12 months, nobody is really maintaining data and, we, and uh, the community loses interest really going for something that's a little bit more standardized and sustainable from that perspective. I think these, these are also key takeaways from my side and obviously going into the data and using them to ask the right questions. Kat, you, you brought it up. How are we doing in diversity and scale ups better than in startups? Why is this the case? What's the impact? How investable am I as a startup if I'm not diverse in terms of gender or in terms of, of passport nationality and culture? What's really the impact? Asking these interesting questions and, and using data in, in that shape or form and peer comparison data in order to really get to the right answers and the right insights. I think um, great, great session today. Again, Kat, Joran, thank you so much for spending the time with us. Here at Genome, what's coming next um, on the, first of all, if you, any, if you have any questions to, to the topic of today, you want to see the slides, et cetera, please contact um, our colleague, Adam Brigo in Berlin, in Berlin, Director of Business Development and Partnerships. He'll be most happy to respond. Um, and important, um, next time, it's the 11th of May, 8 a.m. London time and 8 a.m. Pacific time, we will be talking with Max Menke, uh, founding partner of GrowthX, um, under the, the really interesting topic, value creation, not valuation. Uh, I find it intriguing. Let's see what we have to serve up on the 11th of May. Please join us. And thanks for being with us this afternoon or this morning. Take care very much and thanks, hope to speak fun. to you. Yep.